The uh, one, two, three modern leaders of uh, Asia's largest countries, India, Indonesia and China, all have uh, substantial tasks ahead of them if they're going to continue building their country's success and make their mark on the national level and also on the global stage. Significant as they were, the priorities presented to former leaders like Nehru, Mao and Suharto were to move their people out of poverty. And to this end, Asia today is one of the world's success stories with an exploding middle class in China alone. Over 600 million people have been released from poverty. However, my next guest believes that uh, Xi Jinping, Narendra Modi and Jokowi Widodo all have the chance to become their country's greatest modern leaders. My next guest being the admirable Kishore Mahbubani, Kishore is Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, the author of numerous books. I spoke to him most recently about his newie, The Great Convergence, where he pointed out that 88% of the world's population outside the West is rising to Western living standards. He wrote that this new global civilization needs a new global order, one shared between the East and the West. Wonderful to have you back, Kishore. This is uh, a delight as ever. The top three thinkers from Prospect's 2014 lists are Indians, writing predominantly on matters of economic development. Yes. This would seem a considerable achievement. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, you know, the if you look at the uh, top academics in American universities, it's actually quite remarkable how many of them come from India. Uh, the dean of the Harvard Business School is Nitin Nuria uh, from India. And indeed, the governor of the Central Bank of India today, Raghuram Rajan, who was featured in the Financial Times recently, uh, was a professor at the University of Chicago. So I think Indians have done exceptionally well uh, in Western academic circles. In your essay, you refer to what used to be called the first world, and uh, you're suggesting that term is up for revision. Yes, I think, you know, the clearly uh, the next 10 to 20 years could be among the best 10 to 20 years that Asia uh, would have enjoyed in 300 years. And this is because, as you mentioned earlier in your remarks, of the remarkable coincidence that the three largest countries, China, India, and Indonesia, uh, simultaneously have three of the strongest leaders uh, in their history emerging uh, at the same time. So given the base of development that all three have had over the past few decades, they've been, in a sense, rolling down the runaway, and they're ready for takeoff. And it's good that they're ready for takeoff with three strong leaders at the helm uh, at these countries. Well, the two most influential leaders in Indonesia, Sukarno and Suharto, uh, who, tell me about the new fella. Well, Jokowi, I must say, uh, I spent seven hours with him uh, in December last year, driving around Jakarta in his car. So I got to know him reasonably well, and I discovered that he has some uh, remarkable strengths, you know. He's, number one, he's completely honest. And, you know, integrity is so important to success. Number two, he's very dynamic. He's a problem solver. He gets things done. So there was a highway that had been uh, held up, was 90% complete, and the remaining 10% had been held up for 16 years. He cleared the roadblocks and completed the highway. Thirdly, he's very pragmatic. Uh, he's studying other countries' experience and trying to bring the best of the other countries' experience to Indonesia. In fact, that's why he invited me to spend seven hours with him because as the dean of a school of public policy in Singapore, he thought he and I could have a dialogue on how you get good governance in a place like Indonesia. How should he go about creating the institutional foundations for that good governance? Well, I think he's, uh, he's looking for the best possible people uh, to serve around him, and that's a good start because that's how Singapore succeeded. You know, Singapore succeeded through a policy called meritocracy, whereby you don't appoint your uncles or aunties or your first cousins to the cabinet. You actually pick the best people and you appoint them to the cabinet 
and to run the organizations. And he's he's begun to implement the principle of meritocracy. And you know, a real political miracle has happened in Jakarta because Anto has recently, as 14 to 15 years, remember in 1998, there were ethnic riots in Jakarta and Chinese were being killed. Today, the the governor of Jakarta is a Chinese ethnic citizen of Indonesia. That's a remarkable political miracle, you know. And that's a result of uh, President Jokowi selecting the best possible person to be his deputy when he was governor of Jakarta. So here's a bloke who's risen from humble beginnings to the apex of power, but thus far hasn't compromised his image as a man of the people. That's right. And he, you know, when I would travel with him, he arrived unannounced at a hospital. And my God, when he walked in, all the patients stood up and cheered and said, <laughs> this is our man. And, and it was stunning. I mean, he, I've never seen, I mean, I, I, I've met several leaders. But, you know, there are very few leaders when they walk in the room, people will stand up and cheer for them. But Kishore, you and I are old enough to know that often politicians come in with the bringing with them the highest of hopes. A certain contemporary American president comes to mind, but they've got a That's terrible right. habit of breaking your heart. Yeah, you're, 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 I think you're extremely right in uh, expressing these words of caution because I too have been somewhat disappointed by President Barack Obama because he came in with such high hopes, gave such brilliant speeches about how America is going to improve its relations with the Islamic world, and then he failed to deliver. Yes, he, he, talked, he talked the talk, but he finally hasn't been able to walk the walk. But your bloke has already has already refurbished his, yeah. uh, his area, and he's yeah. going to tackle, it would seem, quite difficult yeah. things like yeah. unsustainable fuel subsidies. That's right. And you see, unlike Barack Obama, um, Governor Jokowi, who is now going to become President Jokowi, has actually run now run two cities and made him, uh, significant reforms in, in both of them. He's actually done uh, serious day-to-day -day management of, of tough challenges, whereas Barack Obama never, ever held an executive position before he became uh, CEO of America. Now, uh, and in the case of uh, Governor Jokowi, he's extremely aware that these, these fuel, sus fuel subsidies of Indonesia are unsustainable and something has to be done to reduce them. And he's very cleverly started a political campaign through social media to inform the Indonesian people that we can make much better use of this money instead of subsidizing uh, fuel for the middle class population of Indonesia. How How is he going to implement this idea of a merit-based system of cabinet appointments that really confronts the uh, the political and business elites in Indonesia? They won't like that at all. No, I think, frankly, the uh, my sense when I talk to the uh, business elites in Indonesia, they are extremely happy uh, that President Jokowi has been elected because they know and this is a fact, this is the reason why schools of public policy like mine are very important, because the best uh, foundation for business success is good governance. When you have reliable, predictable governance, and you know, I'll give you one concrete example. Uh, Governor Jokowi used to run a furniture company in East Java, and he was exporting furniture to Europe and America. So he understands the importance of logistics. He understands the importance of making sure your ports and airports function uh, efficiently. So if he fixes the ports of Indonesia alone, that would help Indonesian businessmen dramatically. Uh, that's, as you know, a major bottleneck for growth and uh, development. And he understands that because he's been a former businessman himself. LNL on RN, and we're talking to Kishore Mababani from the National University of Singapore. Would you tell me about the Pact of Mexico? Because you want him to model his governance on this. Hmm. Well, I think, you know, the, I, I must say I'm very impressed by the uh, uh, president of uh, Mexico and his efforts to uh, bring a new, how do you say, a new spirit uh, to the governance of Mexico. Because Mexico, as you know, as a country, has struggled very hard uh, to get out of its uh, previous models of governance. 
And in in Mexico, there's now a cross party pact. That's right. Could and that's what he, is is it possible to bring that off in Indonesia? Well, I think he will definitely have to do it because he has no choice. You know, the party, his party, con- does not control the parliament. This is a big advantage that Prime Minister Modi has over President Jokowi because Prime Minister Modi, somewhat uh, through a miracle, has managed to achieve control of the Indian parliament. He doesn't have that. And so uh, I have absolutely no doubt that uh, uh, President Jokowi would work with other parties. And, you know, he's he's very fortunate that he's got as his vice president Yusuf Kala, who, as you know, is very influential in the Golka Party, which is the largest party. So the Golka Party teams up and supports the new uh, president. Then they'll have a much stronger uh, uh, political base. But let's, let's go back to Obama, who reached out, reached across the political divide when he gained the gained the White House, wanting and offering all sorts of deals, you know, in in his negotiations with the Republicans, and they uh, gave him the shortest of shrift. There was a pale echo of that in Australia when when Rudd, as Prime Minister, made all sorts of overtures to to Mm. the Conservatives, Mm. and he too was very, very energetically Mm. snubbed. Are you confident that won't happen in Indonesia? Oh, uh, I'm actually very confident that uh, it will not happen in Indonesia because culture is a factor here, you know. And in Indonesian culture, there's a tendency to have what they call mushafara and mufakat, uh, which in, in Bahasa Indonesia means consultation and consensus. And that's the Javanese trait that they have. And there's less polarization in that sense. And so they're very pragmatic. And it's much easier for people to work across parties within Indonesia than it is in the uh, Western context. And I think in the case of Washington, D.C., I think one mistake that uh, uh, President Barack Obama made was that he played golf alone and didn't play golf with Republican congressmen and senators. Uh, And that's what, as you know, that's the reason why Lyndon Baines Johnson was such an effective uh, president of, uh, of America because he knew how to make deals and wheel and deal with uh, uh, congressmen and senators. And that's something that, unfortunately, Barack Obama hasn't been good at doing. But Lyndon Johnson had something else going for him. He was incredibly courageous. He would take on the, you know, the putative enemy at, at knowing that it could uh, really stuff his own party up for decades. I haven't yeah. seen that sort of courage uh, too often in our part of the world. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm reasonably confident that President Jokowi uh, will do that. He's actually uh, stood up to some uh, vested interests uh, in Indonesia. He, for example, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a very difficult thing that he did, okay? Some of the waterworks uh, in Jakarta were, were being badly affected by slums, uh, slum dwellers around these reservoirs. And, you know, the hardest thing in developing countries is to persuade slum dwellers to leave their homes. And he did it, you know. That's an amazing political feat. You know, that's the kind of hands-on thing that requires a very delicate touch. Well, uh, we, we did a program the other night on uh, the Indian plan to build five million toilets in 100 yeah. days, and exactly the same cultural problem comes up when you look at that. It's one yeah. thing to build the toilets. It's quite another thing to overcome mm. generations of cultural attitudes to get people to use them. You're, you're absolutely right. But I think it's at the same time, I must say, Prime Minister Modi will go down in history as the first Indian Prime Minister to talk about toilets in his speech. I bet you, if you did a word check of the speeches of any Indian Prime Minister before Narendra Modi, none would have mentioned the word toilets. And oh, I no, I'm, 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 look, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in not Indian in any culture, way trying way, to diminish yeah, the, the scale yeah. or the ambition. It's terrific. Yeah. It's just that... Uh, and, and for him to say that India needs more toilets than temples is an incredibly brave statement to make, you know? I want to get back to India a little later, but let's now whiz off to, to China. And you call the new president one of the strongest leaders in the world. Yes. Tell me why. 
Well, you know, he's, you know, in, in, in the West, you have an expression that somebody is very strong if you can tear up a telephone book into two, right? Uh, now, he's done the political equivalent of tearing up two or three telephone books because in the space of a couple of years, he's accumulated more power than any of his immediate predecessors and he's been able to take on very powerful figures like Bo Shilai and General Shu and send them to uh, to jail and so on and so forth. That's remarkable, you know. In, in, a, in a society like China, which is so huge and so complex, uh, uh, and you try to accumulate power in that kind of setting, is very difficult, but he's done it. And he seems to have done it without too much brutality. He seems to have done it more with finesse. Exactly. And and I think he's been able to persuade people, especially in the Communist Party, that what he's doing is good for them and good for the long-term interests of China. So you think that he may, in fact, become a significant successor to Mao Zedong and, uh, and Deng Xiaoping? Yes, yes. I think this this is the other remarkable parallel, as I mentioned in my article, about Indonesia, India, and China, is that each of the present leaders has the opportunity to become the third most effective leader of the modern generations of their countries. And certainly after Mao and Deng, Xi Jinping will go down as the third most uh, effective leader because already uh, in his first two years, he's shown that he's got uh, more political courage and more political skill than any of his immediate predecessors. Now, you use a, an a culturally appropriate term for corruption in China, the mm. massive dragon. Is this guy capable of being St. George? Oh, I, I, I think he is going to be, because he realises that the one thing that will uh, delegitimize the Communist Party of China and destroy it is corruption. And I think he, he, he's also seen what has happened to the Soviet Union, how the Communist Party uh, collapsed and disappeared. And he knows that it could happen in China too, unless he cleans up the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Now, does that mean he'll get down corruption to zero? Of course not. It's impossible. But has he, will, he, will he be effective in reducing corruption? Of course he will be uh, effective in reducing corruption. Let me tell you a small story, okay? There's a Chinese entrepreneur I know who's lived in America and China. And he said to me, you know, Kishore, when I used to go back to China in the 1980s or 1990s, and I would get, a, get stopped by a traffic cop, I would just pay a small amount of money and I would get away with it. He says, today, if you go to Shanghai, you try to pay off a traffic cop, you get arrested right away. I hope you now haven't, that, I that, hope that, you that, haven't that, done that, that recently. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, that shows how things can change, you know. Okay. You, can, you, can, you can change the culture. And Singapore, as you know, has been very successful in eradicating corruption. And China is learning lessons from Singapore. I'm suddenly looking at a very different place. I'm looking at the Vatican when we've got a reformist pope. But, uh, and he's doing his best, but he's going to have to battle the entrenched sort of uh, people around him, the curia around him. And, yeah. of course, she will have this same problem. Yeah. I mean, the, the en enmity he must be generating within Beijing and elsewhere. No, I think, to be fair, uh, there, there are, I must say, there are also lots of honest leaders uh, in China. And the man who's actually doing the tough work, as you know, is Wang Qishan, who's been assigned the very difficult job of taking on the, the battle against uh, corruption. So he's not fighting it alone. He's got a, a strong people on his team uh, working with him. And, you know, he enjoys a, a remarkable degree of legitimacy partly because of his heritage, you know, and, 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 and the tough life that he has led himself. And he struggled all the way. He suffered through the Cultural Revolution. He's done uh, uh, remarkable work on his way up. So he knows what he's doing. And he's, he's got a, re a determination that almost no other Chinese leader has today. You remember a marvellous moment in Indian history when the president was 
an untouchable, a wonderful fellow who'd been a, a diplomat yeah. with strong Australian connections. That's right. And as a consequence, I was allowed in to see him while the BJP were rattling the gates outside. It was a major constitutional crisis. Yeah. And our view of the BJP then could hardly have been more jaundiced. Mm. Now, here's Modi, Hindu nationalist, a man under whose watch as chief minister of Gujarat, thousands of Muslims were killed. Mm. And you see this man as capable of escaping the gravitational pull of his past and becoming a great reformist, not only, yeah, in, well, not only in toilets. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, I called on him when he was chief minister of Gujarat because, you know, I'm chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize nominating committee and Ahmedabad was shortlisted for the award one year. So I spent two hours in his office and, you know, that man is absolutely focused on his work and on improving and reforming at that time Gujarat and, and, and Ahmedabad. And he, uh, uh, he, as you know, he has no personal life. Uh, he, he's basically separated from his wife. He gets to the office before anybody does at 5 a.m. in the morning and continues working till late at night. And he's also a great learner uh, of the best practices uh, from the rest of the world. And that's why under him, the Gujarat economy was growing at an average rate of over 10% over five years. That's amazing, you know. Uh, and, and you notice that he, he also uh, made sure that he went to China four times to learn from China. Now, you, since you mentioned he uh, belongs to the right wing of India, the right wing of India has been beating up on China and he goes to learn from China. That shows how pragmatic he is as a person. You are not without your critics back in Singapore, Kishore. Uh, yes, yes. A recent thing, a recent piece in the Singapore Business Times said this. Some yeah. readers find him excessively given to Asian triumphalism and anti-Western diatribes yeah. and soft on authoritarian regimes. Can you accept any of that criticism? Uh, the, the let me explain to you the point about being anti-Western. You know, when I whenever I speak in Asia, I and the West, I say the reason why the Asian countries are succeeding now is because they're finally understood, absorbed, and are implementing seven pillars of Western wisdom. And when I speak to the students of the Lee Kuan Yew School, I tell them that if your countries want to succeed, whether your country is in Africa or Latin America or in Asia, you have to implement the seven pillars of Western wisdom. Now, if I call on the world to implement seven pillars of Western wisdom, how can I be anti-West? <laughs> Okay. What about the other argument that sometimes you, you seem like an apologist for uh, authoritarian regimes? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, I, I believe that all countries have to become democratic eventually. So that I don't disagree on the destination that democracy is the eventual goal. But at the same time, I also say that the path to democracy is difficult and sometimes along the way you need strong and disciplined governments and indeed the record shows that the countries that actually have had that have had strong and disciplined governments succeeded in becoming then strong democracies uh, subsequently that's what history teaches us and, and, and of course the the other side of the coin is we've got to look at the the all p overwhelming power of the West and look at the IMF the World Bank the United right. Nations completely controlled by the West that's right. And in fact, that's why I also say that what the world needs now is global democracy so that you have one man, one vote, or one person, one vote for seven billion people in the world. And then these, those votes should determine who should run the IMF, the World Bank, and the UN Security Council. And that's, what, that's a nightmare that the West faces in the 21st century. I'll talk to you about that later. Kishore, thank you very much. Kishore Mahabani, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, and author of The Great Convergence, Asia, the West, and The Logic of One World, published by Perseus Books. On our next beloved listeners, Bruce Shapiro and my old pal Gareth Evans on two tumultuous years in the Paul Keating government. I had breakfast with Paul this morning and uh, he had some interesting observations about Gareth. LNL on RN, see you in 23 hours.